Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you all so much for joining. I'm super excited to dive into this topic today. I love solving difficult challenges, so this is going to be great. Um, I want to give everyone just another minute to hop on and make sure that they're all able to use the question box feature in the GoToWebinar app. So if you all could type in while we wait, type in where you're from into the question box. I'll be able to see it and I'll call out some folks. I always love to see who we have on here during the webinars today. Um, so for example, I'm from Boston, Mass. So I wonder if there's anyone else on here today also from Boston, Mass or in the area. But to be fair, we are a, a multinational company that works with folks and businesses from all over the globe, Canada, South America, Europe, and mostly, you know, of course, the Americas as well. So it's always super great to see how webinars can bring folks from different corners into one spot to, you know, have this conversation all together. And I see there's plenty of folks typing in already in the question box. Welcome, welcome. We got Anna from Detroit, Taylor from Farmington Hills, Michigan, Susan from Cold and Rainy, Michigan. Welcome, Susan. We have Jeannie from Magnolia, Arkansas. We have Chelsea from Fort Pierce, Florida. Robin from McKinney, Texas. Tiffany from New Jersey, welcome. Jennifer from Sterling, Colorado, welcome, Jen. Eddie from Singapore, welcome, Eddie. Frank from Brighton, Massachusetts. I'm always over in Brighton. Nice to see you, Matt Frank. We have Lisa from Jacksonville, Florida. Calvin from Southern California. Welcome, Calvin. We have some folks from Europe on here. We have some folks from Canada on here. Welcome, welcome. We have David from Minneapolis, Stan from Pittsburgh. Welcome, welcome. This is awesome. Len from Ontario. Welcome. Bill from Ontario. Welcome. Leona from Alberta, Canada. Welcome. We have Alexandra from Belgrade, Serbia in Europe. Welcome. We have some folks from Houston, Texas. Welcome. We have Robert just saying hi. Hi, Robert. Thank you all for joining. This is great. It always just warms my heart and starts things off on a good note to just see how many different folks we have on here, folks from all different corners. Uh, so this was great. Thank you all so much for, for hopping on today. And let's dig into this webinar. So welcome everyone. Um, a few logistics before we dig into the content today. I want you all to know that this webinar will be recorded. So don't worry about taking notes or anything like that. You'll be able to easily access the recording later on our YouTube channels on the local IQ or WordStream YouTubes. Definitely check them out. You'll be able to find past webinar recordings on there as well. But also know that you'll get the materials in your inbox automatically later today. So you'll able to you'll be able to have a um, inbox or email version of the recording. But if you can't find that, don't worry. Just hop onto our YouTube and you'll find the recording there. So this will be recording. Um, also, again, like I said, just check your inbox for the materials later. And lastly, why I had you all type into the question box is I want you to be comfortable typing in your questions throughout this webinar for the Q and A session at the end. If you've attended any of our past webinars, you know. We love the Q&A sessions. We've had some really great in-depth sessions for Q&A last few times. So definitely type in your questions and save them and type them into the question box at the end for Q&A. Uh, definitely be able to make sure that you're able to use that feature because uh, I love answering your questions. So I'll be able to see those at the end of the webinar and we'll dig into those. And for all of you here today, um, some of you might be already working with us over at Local IQ. Some of you might be familiar. Some of you might be totally new and welcome. And some of you might be familiar with or working with our sister brands, WordStream and Reach Local. So for all of the folks on the call today, I want to get us on the same page as to who Local IQ is. So we're Local IQ, which is essentially a fully integrated growth marketing platform that helps growing businesses combine innovative technology and unparalleled expertise to be equipped to handle anything that the marketing landscape throws at them. So that's essentially who we are and how we exactly help growing businesses grow is we have technology at our core, right? So we have proprietary AI technology that's sourced from data from over 1 million campaigns that we're all constantly running um, to give you results that you can't find anywhere else. We also have free marketing tools at your fingertips so that you're able to use those tools to save you time so that you can put more time back into your day to focus on growing your business. And then we also have, of course, the proven results to back it, right? So we've been in the digital marketing space for over 15 years, which is kind of crazy to think about when you think about the 
the age of digital marketing itself. Really, online marketing and online promotion has really only been around for some odd 15 years or more as well. So we've kind of been there throughout the entire journey of the landscape evolution, and we combine our data, technology, and expertise to help you grow. So a common question I get on these webinars a lot is where can you learn more about us? I always tell folks, definitely check out our websites, of course, localiq.com, and then also our sister brand, wordstream.com. Check out our blog. We cover all of the topics that we cover in these webinars, super in-depth on there. So if you ever need more information, have questions, want some more, take some more time with some of the topics that we discuss, definitely check out our blogs for those. And also, please be sure to follow us on social media. Definitely check out our LinkedIn's, Twitter's, and Facebook profiles. Um, make sure you follow us, like us. Um, you'll get information on upcoming webinars. If you'd like to join more of these in the future, we do them monthly. And we also share other interesting case studies, blog posts, any sort of promotions that we're doing. So definitely check it out to just be up and up on the latest and greatest with Local IQ and WordStream and Reach Local. So a little bit about me, your presenter for today. Hello, it's wonderful to meet you all. My name is Susie. I'm a content marketing specialist over at Local IQ, where I write edu educational content on anything under the digital marketing sun. And how I came into this role was I actually was a former digital marketing consultant over at WordStream, where I was coaching real businesses and folks just like you through the day-to-day -day of digital marketing best practices. So I took that knowledge of being in the real world of digital marketing and applied it to the educational content I write on our blog and in these webinars today. A fun fact about me is I'm based out of Boston and we're currently fast approaching my favorite season. A lot of folks disagree with this opinion, but I love the winter. It's my favorite season. I love to go snowboarding on the weekends in between work. So that's what I don't do. That's what I do when I'm not doing my nine to five. Um, and it's been kind of warm here. So I'm really hoping for you know some good snow this year. So we're fast approaching that. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, I also share a lot of the local IQ WordStream buzz and articles that we do and webinars that we do. So what we'll be covering today is again, those search marketing challenges, those toughest curveballs that Google ads, Microsoft ads, and those types of platforms throw at you. Uh, so of course, we're gonna dig into the hot ticket item, which is third-party data going away, the deprecation of third-party cookies. If that sounds like a foreign language to you, don't worry, this webinar is here to meet everyone at the level that they're at. So we're gonna do a deep dive into that and to cover the basics into how you can solve that problem. We're also going to talk about display ads and how they correlate to your search campaigns. We're also going to discuss some of the match type madness that we've definitely dealt with if we've been advertising on Google ads or Microsoft ads. We know there's been changes to the match types and the matching behavior of keywords that we're bidding on. So we're gonna dive into that. Also common issue across search marketing, but also any platform is of course ad fatigue. You know, most of us have you know, a key core audience that we constantly want to be advertising to, but that audience can easily tire out. So we're going to dig into why that happens, how you can solve that. And then of course, keyword research. Everybody knows that they need to do keyword research. They know they need to be doing keyword research frequently, but of course that's easier said than done. So we're going to dig into that challenge as well. And then lastly, I'll leave you all with some thought starters to just keep in mind going forward with your search marketing and beyond. And we'll dive into the Q&A section, which like I mentioned, I'm super excited for that. I love digging into your questions. So if you've attended any of our past webinars, you know I love to keep our attendees on the toes. So we're, uh, we're gonna start off with a pop quiz, You know, type into the question box. I wanna hear what's your most common challenge when you're um, implementing search marketing for your business? Do you feel like it's been pretty easy so far? You haven't felt any challenges? Is it you know that common one that everyone's you know, kind of talks about is like, I'm just not getting enough conversions, but it definitely leads down to a snowball effect of you're not getting conversions because of X, Y, Z issue. Is it tracking? Is it conversion tracking even? Is it possibly just finding the right keywords or finding the right audience? Um, just kind of seeing the ROI here. I just wanna see you know what folks might be struggling with in their search marketing so that I can keep that in mind as we talk about these hot common problems that we see a lot. Uh, so Tiffany here says, you know, not being necessarily sure what to look for, or how to audit her account to know, um, you know, where she should be optimizing and improving. Definitely can feel that. Um, Eddie, high wasted, high um, ad spend waste. So definitely see that, you know, identifying that good ROI. 
Martha with competitor terms, competitors and competition in search marketing is fierce. So I definitely can understand that as well. Lara says connecting it back to the her search engine optimization and her website. Jennifer says, you know, keeping her ranking high. I have written a lot of content around ad rank and I definitely can understand the struggle with ad rank as well. So I'll try and dig into that a little bit. Great point. Uh, Brian says breaking into a highly competitive keyword market. So we're going to talk about some keyword research today. Good call out there, Brian. Uh, Lara says the constant changes with the platforms. I'm going to touch on that as well. I know that there are a ton of platform updates that we're constantly dealing with, uh, which is kind of the point of why we're doing this webinar, right? We have curveballs, like I said, being thrown at us left and right from Google ads, Microsoft ads, on top of trying to manage, promote our business, and handle all these channels. I know that sounds like a lot. Don't worry, we're going to take it step by step today and kind of dissect some of that. So thank you all for participating in that. So the first challenge, of course, is the deprecation of third party cookies. So let's first dig into understanding third party cookies. I've been in the marketing game for a long time. And even for me, it took a while for me to fully grasp, you know, what third party cookies are, what they do and why they're really going away and what their replacement will look like. So third party cookies are, you know, they come from various sources across the web and they collect and store data about just the general consumer's journey across the web. Uh, whereas the solution to third party cookies that we're gonna discuss is called first party data. So instead of coming from third party sources, first party data is data you hold as a business, you hold as a company. So it's collected by your organization and essentially only tracks consumers behavior directly on your own web website rather than tracking their behavior across the web in various websites. So another example would be like third party cookies are kind of like what you would find, be able to pull and find from sources like Google versus in Google ads versus first party data kind of being the information that you would collect, for example, in Google analytics. So I hope that kind of helped break it down. We can definitely dig into it more. Um, I definitely would recommend checking out this infographic over on the left. It kind of discusses, you know, why there's these different types of data here and, you know, how you're being, being able to collect this types of data. So let's dig into why third priority cookies are going away and how you can prepare. So a lot of folks thought the deprecation of third party cookies was happening in 2023, but since we have a premier partnership with Google, we were able to be in the know of understanding that this update actually just changed. Uh, so they announced a few months ago that um, the third deprecation of third party cookies isn't going to happen until the second half of 2024. So you do have a little bit more time, but essentially why they're taking them away is of course, third party cookies feel a little bit intrusive on the consumer side. We're moving towards a more privacy first landscape. Uh, so this way third party cookies, um, you know, are gonna be replaced essentially by first party data. Um, now our premier partnership manager over at Google, our connection over at Google, Jenna, she comes on to our webinars every so often. She's a great resource. And I wanted to pull this quote from her that helps kind of round up, you know, why this change is happening and what first party data is and why it's being replaced um, for third party data. So again, it's that data that you hold as a company. So a lot of businesses have a CRM, right? A customer relationship management software where they're tracking those leads and closing those sales. So essentially, instead of being able to track those leads and you know pull that data and those types of audiences from Google via third-party cookies, you're using that data that you collect directly through your CRM and uploading it straight to Google. So that'll be a new um, ability to do so. Now, if you don't have a CRM, don't worry. While it is a good idea to try and get comfortable with the CRM now to start collecting and efficiently managing your first party data, again, local IQ as a proprietary technology marketing platform has all of this ability within itself to kind of collect some of that lead generation data for you. Um, so, of course, as we're talking about collecting data as a business, you definitely want to start putting some lead magnets throughout your site so that you're able to actually collect data. Now, I understand it's going to be hard to get folks to just like, you know, fill out a form on your site or whatnot, but just in general, like setting up some solid tracking systems so that you can track, you know, how many visitors you're getting accurately, what they're doing, are they clicking a button, are they watching a video, are they filling out that lead collection form, and, you know, just finding new innovative ways to collect leads and collect as much information as possible from your website visitors, so you're really able to understand your own audience. So some of the other solutions that you can think about when third-party cookie deprecation does come around in about a year and a half, 
is just, again, some of those additional ways to capture information. So for example, Facebook lead ads are a great solution and a complementary strategy to your search marketing campaigns. So essentially, while we might not be able to collect as much or use the same types of audiences in our search marketing as we once were, we're able to use different platforms instead to still get those same results. So a lead generation um, campaign on Facebook can really work in unison with your search efforts. Um, you can optimize it by, of course, adding custom questions to try and collect as much information as possible. Um, also limiting your fields so that people don't tire out and that way you can collect as many leads as possible as well. Um, and then also using that leads that you collect um, and implementing them into other channels. So you're really um, going to be opting for this holistic marketing approach rather than just relying on third-party data with your search marketing, right? So you're gonna be getting a little bit from your search marketing still, implementing those new audiences that you're able to collect, but then also collecting leads and actively nurturing those leads on channels like Facebook, email, your website, and more. Also, speaking of your website, you can swap out your cookies with capture code. So that's an ability that we have here at Local IQ to track information with a code it's an easy swap on your business website rather than a cookie. Um, so again, you're leveraging technology to track information with the code rather than cookies. And then lastly, you want to maybe take a look at some other solutions. So we have some sm uh, smart social advertising solutions. So it's a technology backed strategy where you're essentially doing a multi channel approach to your marketing. So again, you'll be running your search marketing, but then supplementing it with so social ads across multiple different platforms. So we're, we will be able to promote your business across multiple social platforms in addition to search, but then also optimize that budget across platforms automatically based off data and historical performance. So that way you're really able to have a highly attuned campaign on each possible platform to maximize the amount of times that your audience is able to see your business, but also provide leads for your business so that you can grow. So something else that folks struggle with a lot is seeing the value in display ads while they're running search search campaigns. I'm a little biased because I absolutely love display campaigns and display ads, so I can't wait to dive into this challenge with you all. Um, and it kind of makes sense that it is a challenge for a lot of folks um, because if you're thinking about you know when you're running those display campaigns, a display campaign you know tends to really be high in impressions, maybe not really generating clicks or conversions. But then you look over at your search campaign and you see your search campaign getting all these clicks and conversions. Of course, at first glance, you're going to think, well, the search is working and the display is not. But that is actually complete opposite of what's really happening. And that's why I wanted to dig into this um, uh, into this challenge here. So we have this example of a display ad here on the bottom. So those are those image based ads that show passively on websites as your audience is you know, browsing around and then they see your ad. Um, so, you know, you can imagine that you're going to have a high rate of impressions because you're showing passively across all these different placements on these websites. However, right, people are seeing them while they're doing other things across the web. So that makes sense that you're going to get more impressions, but a lower rate of clicks on that actual ad. But that still can actually impact your search campaigns. Um, because, for example, let's say you're a growing business, you need that awareness and you don't necessarily have a ton of brand awareness yet to get people to be looking up and searching your brand name to see click on your search ads. Maybe they don't even know that they need to be searching for you yet. So display ads actually help with that because consumers are 155% more likely to look up brand specific terms after they've seen your display ad. So I think that's that in and of itself kind of speaks to how it can supplement your search campaigns. But there's also a few other things that I want you all to keep in mind. So after folks see a display ad, they're much more likely to conduct, conduct a search for your business. And after they do do that search, they have a much higher likelihood of converting. And they also just, we know off the bat when they see a display ad, they're much more likely to be served a dis, um, to search. So they're going there to search after seeing your display ad. So while at first glance, it might not really look like your display campaign is doing much, you might find that if you were to turn off that display campaign, your search results go down, down, down because your display campaign is really what's supplementing your search to get folks to actually be typing in keywords and branded keywords to find your business um, through search. So it's really helpful to have both together, um, really impactful stats here. So how you can kind of solve this 
problem here is a couple things. So I kind of alluded to this when we were talking about the behavior of how people are seeing your ad and then they're going to the search bar and actually typing your business's name in. So let's say they do that, right? And they click on your search ad and then they convert. Well, if you don't have the right kind of tracking in place, it's going to look like that conversion is going to be immediately attributed to your search campaign. When really your display ad was doing all the heavy lifting. It's kind of like when you work on a group project with someone and you know you have one final person that does a presentation and gets an A, but really you're the person that did all the work. I love to use that example because it's kind of the same dynamic here. The display campaign is doing the heavy lifting to actually push somebody to put in the type in your keyword in the search bar and then eventually convert off your search campaign. So what I'm describing here is called a view through conversion. And we're able to track view through conversions here on local IQ, which you can see in our client center view here. Um, so this is just an example view of some of the reporting abilities that we have and tracking abilities that we have for display. Um, of course, this is a sample account. So some of the client information has been blurred out for privacy reasons. But if, I want you guys to understand that some of the metrics that you're really able to dig in here with a display campaign. So while at first glance, it might look like your search campaign is doing all the work, your display campaign can be attributed to conversions through that view through conversion tracking. The other point that I wanted to point out here is also the audiences here. So we see that there's multiple different audiences that are based off different um, behaviors within this potential specific accounts site. So if you see here, folks that are interested in cataract treatment versus LASIK treatment versus optical for this eye business is going to have different types of display ads. So you're able to track the actual activity of specific types of audiences and you know maybe do some geofencing to show them a specific type of ad and so on. So there's a ton of different ways you can really segment out your display ads to maximize the um, actual value of them. So just again, narrowing in on those audiences and being able to track and segment those audiences accordingly, and then also being able to track those conversions correctly is going to really help show the value in your display campaigns. So our third challenge here with search marketing is of course changes to keyword match types. Keyword match types, I feel like we can never catch a break. There have been a ton of updates on this platform, Google Ads and Microsoft Ads over the last couple of years. So let's dig into it. So let's first talk about the updated keyword match types, what our choices are for match types right now in this day and age with search marketing. So for search marketing, right, we know we have these keywords that we bid on um, to show that would match up to queries in a search bar, and then our ad would show. So match types act as pretty much a restrictor of those keywords. So it kind of tells Google, all right, Google, I wanna bid on this specific key term, this keyword, but I only want to bid on search queries that have this keyword when they include you know, other words or they don't include other words. So it's kind of like that restrictor that you know, is applied to your keyword to kind of tell Google what types of queries are really going to match up to that keyword. So, if you're familiar with some of the, the history behind this and totally fine if you're not, there was at one point in time, four different match types. We used to have broad match, phrase match, exact match, and then the old modified broad match. And modified broad match was a common default for a lot of businesses because of course it was you know kind of like that happy medium or that gold, Goldilocks match type, as I like to say, where it wasn't too restrictive, where you weren't getting any results, but it also wasn't, so restrictive uh, or not restrictive enough where you were kind of just showing for anything and everything. So they decided to take away broad, modified broad match because we're moving towards, again, kind of this just more technology-based landscape with Google Ads where we're going to use you know more broad match because essentially Google's machine learning has gotten a lot better. So it knows what types of contacts and queries that you should be showing for, especially with the rules of like close variance where you know if there's misspellings or plurals or you know certain endings within your keywords that you know could be could be considered separate keywords in the past google is able to read through those and still match your keyword up so you don't need as many types of different types of match types to tell google what you should be showing for so as we can see here we have just these three different types of match types today and again the the matching behavior has definitely changed right so we have broad match um, so that's pretty much going to allow your keywords and your ads to show for any query pretty much contextually similar or related to your search. 
versus freeze match. You can have your, it's kind of like, again, that Goldilocks match type, I would say, a good starter match type for folks. Um, so it includes, you know, search queries for your ads and your keywords that include the meaning of your keywords. So again, kind of looking at context there. Um, and then lastly, exact match still remains as the most restrictive match type. Um, so that, of course, will only allow your ads to show for searches that have the same exact meaning or include like your exact um, term in the right order um, in the in the search query. Um, and I think this this graphic on the left kind of explains a little bit better why you might want a certain match type over another. A lot of folks think by default they want exact match, right? Because obviously you want to show for ads uh, for queries that are as close to your keyword as possible. That's why you're bidding on that keyword. But that's not really realistic and it can often be too restrictive for folks that are just trying to generate those clicks in that traffic. Uh, so it really kind of depends on your goals. If you want to be showing as much as you can, maybe generate some brand awareness, you might want to be relying on broad match a little bit more to increase your reach and sacrifice a little bit of that quality traffic there versus, of course, the relevancy is going to increase when you restrict yourself down to phrase match or exact match. So there is no right or wrong answer there. It's kind of going to come down to, you know, testing, right? So I definitely recommend folks try different match types here. And also, again, being more comfortable uh, with different match types. A lot of folks are really scared to try broad match. And I totally understand you don't want to show for irrelevant searches. But at the end of the day, with the landscape changing so much, you need to be able to still be generating, generating lots of impressions and clicks so that you can see results. So that's how broad match can really help you out. So obviously the match types are going to continue to evolve and evolve and evolve. We've seen a lot of changes already where it took away a match type. It updated how the matching behavior actually works. So these platforms are changing and they're going to continue to change match types. So like I mentioned, just being flexible, um, getting comfortable with broad match to help scale your campaigns, get you more traffic, get you more impressions. Um, the other thing that broad match does really well with is helping you think of new keywords, right? So when we're talking about you know, the struggle with discovering new keywords and, you know, knowing what keywords will help you stay in this competitive space. Broad match can help with that because you'll be able to see the search terms that you showed for in the search terms report. Um, and you'll be able to see those different types of queries that you might not necessarily have thought of or have shown for if you weren't using broad match. So I think that's a big win for broad match that a lot of people overlook because again, broad, broad match is kind of that big bad wolf but it can really be helpful for your campaigns. Another thing you can do if you feel uncomfortable with the matching behavior that you're working with right now with your match types is to add additional targeting parameters. Now, I would say be careful with this, but definitely this can be helpful for your search campaign. So for example, you could try and layer on an audience. It is going to be very restrictive because you're going to say, well, hey, Google, not only do I only want to show for um, queries that have this type of keyword at this type of match type level um, in the search bar, you know, maybe I only want to show in this area, maybe I also only want to show during this time of day, and I only want to show to this type of person, right? So your, your odds of actually showing for a query get smaller and smaller as you add on these additional targeting parameters. So don't go too crazy where you end up limiting yourself and you don't get any results because it can definitely happen on search campaigns more so than other campaign types. But this can be a really good kind of fallback if you feel like you're getting a ton of traffic still that you feel is ir irrelevant or if you feel like, you know, you're not really showing for the searches that you want to. Well, you could still potentially be showing to the person that you want to show for or in a certain area, close to your business and so on. So try and tack on those additional targeting parameters. Also, you want to um, keep in mind your other options out there. So of course, keyword automation. Um, we're relying more and more on this machine learning in Google Ads. So we're also, you know, upping our proprietary AI technology over here at Local IQ. So we actually automatically optimize your match types for you and your keywords for you. And we also automatically add negative keywords, which negate out certain terms so you don't show for them uh, for you automatically for best performance. So this way, negative keywords are another really great tool to help kind of um, reel in your match types if you feel like they're not doing the job that they should be. So that's just another great fallback and another great uh, possible solution here. All right, so our 
fourth, second to last challenge here is ad fatigue. I know that we've all felt ad fatigue. It's definitely out there. It happens all the time. I'm sure all of you right now can probably think of an ad that you've seen a million times that you're just sick of. So let's kind of talk about that and how you can save your audience from feeling the same way that we are all right now with that one ad in our head. So ad fatigue, it happens much more than you think. Actually, nearly 80% of consumers today say they are seeing too many ads from the same brand. So that means that the space is super saturated. You're And it's understandable, right? Because you want to show as much as possible to your ideal audience. But at the same time, your ideal audience realizes that and they get inundated with all these ads all day from all these different brands, right? Because, you know, not only are you online, your competitors are also online. So you wanna be able to keep up, but also not tire out your audience. Um, so the first thing that we wanna keep in mind with ad fatigue is it can impact your campaign performance and your tracking. Um, and a lot of people don't always necessarily think about that. Um, you know, if you think about it, when you are, you know, running this campaign and let's say it shows way too often to the same audience, but you don't necessarily realize that when you're looking at the metrics, right? you end up thinking, hmm, this new campaign just really isn't performing that well. Well, maybe it was at one point in time, but you know, your audience got sick of the ad. So it's that's something you can't always know from the metrics. So you kind of have to understand the patterns of your audience, the space that you're in, um, and having some of those insights like some platforms provide. For example, ad frequency is a common metric that people rely on on Facebook to know whether or not their ads are getting a little too tired by the frequency as to which how many times it's going to show to the same person. Um, so there are some metrics that can help you with that. But again, um, you know, it's it's it really can happen more often than you think, especially for example, again, a new campaign, right? You might see a new campaign take off at first, right? Maybe it's getting great results, but then you start to see the results just nosedive. They're doing much worse. The metrics aren't there anymore. Of course, at first glance, you're going to think, all right, what happened to this campaign? What am I doing wrong? And you might be digging into all sorts of different details within the campaign that actually don't need to be optimized. It's more just a matter of the frequency and the fatigue within your audience. So that's first and foremost. It can definitely sway how you're tracking. And again, especially with new campaigns, you want to see how it performs. So you don't want to overtie your audience and then think that this new strategy that you're trying isn't the right strategy because it very well could be. Um, of course, you're going to lo lose out on those growth opportunities. Folks aren't going to want to engage with your business more than they already are. So let's say I'm running um, a lot of search ads and I want to grow my following on social media. If people are already sick of seeing my search ads, their odds are they're probably not going to follow me on social media or vice versa. And then the last thing is, again, it's kind of a low quality experience. And I guarantee you the audience that you're targeting right now is most likely a very high quality audience for your business, right? So you don't want to provide a low, low quality experience for a high quality audience. They're, they're, they deserve more than that. They're, you know, worth more than that to your business. So you need to find new ways to avoid ad fatigue. So stop ad fatigue in its tracks with um, first and foremost, a multi-channel strategy. I kind of alluded to that when we were talking about, you know, how someone could see your search ad and then might not want to see, you know, your social media or vice versa. So if you have more opportunities to show in different places, people are going to have a new experience every time. So when you implement a multi-channel or cross-channel strategy where you're trying different types of ads on different platforms, that'll give something fresh for your audience to look at. And again, it'll capture audiences in different places. So sure, somebody might not necessarily look up your business on social media from seeing a search campaign, but they could very well end up easily following you from a search ad, from a social ad on social media. Uh, so just trying those different ad formats, we have, um, again, multiple different social ad solutions and audience options to choose from. So definitely leverage, you know, different audiences and different platforms to just get your business out there and kind of spread out what you're running so that you're able to avoid fatigue. Also keep an eye on your metrics. So as soon as something ad copy wise, like if you're looking at ad metrics specifically um, in search marketing or really any platform, and you see it start to kind of go down, I would first refer to the copy and to the creative. So make sure that you're refreshing that regularly uh, to 
to kind of re-optimize according to the results and the data that you're seeing. If an ad's doing great, you know, as they say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, definitely, you know, you don't have to be switching your ads every day. But if an ad starts to decline, that could definitely be an indicator that you're hitting that ad fatigue wall and you need to refresh your ad copy. And I know that refreshing ad copy isn't always easy, right? There's only so many different ways you can say, you know, your promotion or whatever it may be. Um, but just taking a few minutes to just try and, you know, tweak something. It doesn't have to be a major change, but just trying something small, trying a different promotion, trying a different word here or there um, to match your keywords better, things like that, um, you know, basing it off the search terms that you're showing for. Those are all different ways that you can, you know, switch up your ad copy in your, in your ads uh, to, to better meet your audience's needs. And then lastly, of course, we want to embrace change. I know it's hard, especially when we find a campaign that's really doing well for us, but we need to know that digital marketing is constantly changing and your results are going to ebb and flow. So your strategy should be nimble and flexible to keep up with that, right? So make sure you're trying things like A-B testing, where you're testing out different types of creative or different types of audiences or copy. Um, and that is another way to just always be constantly serving something fresh to your audience when you're trying different tests, different segments. There's tons of different things you, you can play around with. So don't be afraid to play around with them. Um, again, I know it takes a little bit of time, but it will be well worth it um, when you see the results from your audience. And lastly, our final search marketing challenge here is one that I think everybody struggles with. I don't care who you are, I definitely feel it too. Finding new keywords, it's such a struggle, especially in today's world where we already have an idea of our core terms. We know the keywords that we want. We know the keywords that we want to show for, but they can get competitive, right? It's a very saturated space these days, in fact, um, and it can be hard to keep up. However, there is tons of more opportunities for keywords out there. In fact, there's over 15% of searches have never been seen by Google before every day. So that means there's constantly new searches coming around every day. So that means that there's new types of keywords, new keyword combinations that you could be um, leveraging in your keyword research and in your keyword strategy. Um, the reason why you want really good keyword research is just let's take a step back as to why pay-per-click advertising or search marketing is so valuable to your business. When you have the right strategy in place and you're bidding on the right keywords, you're gonna end up seeing potentially a 200% ROI. And as we can see, it can, of course, double, it acts as a faucet, right? It turns that traffic right on. It can double the amount of website visitors you might be getting from search engine optimization or organic results. Um, it is important to have both and actually your SEO keyword strategy can actually be very telling to your PPC keyword strategy. But just keep in mind, when you have the right keywords, you're going to see really, really great results with your search marketing. So that's why I say as much as it sucks to you know, have to be constantly going through keyword research and trying to optimize your keywords or think of new keywords, it's well worth it. So what you can do is first look at the resources you have at hand. A lot of people don't realize this, but Google search, plain old Google search is a really great place to think of new keywords. Um, so if you were to type in like a popular term for your business, you might see some of the suggestions in the drop down, or you might see some of the suggestions in the people also ask session section, or you might even see um, certain terms in your competitors ads or organic results. Those are all great places to just generally get an idea of some other keyword options. Um, also, you can try tools like Google Trends, which shows the, it's not necessarily to help you think of new keywords, but it can also tell you if certain keywords are gonna be of high volume, which is also very important for keywords because you don't want a keyword that's gonna never be searched, right? Because then you'll never show. Um, so I'm checking out Google Trends as well. And then I already mentioned this previously, but the search terms report in Google Ads, which we actively um, bring into our reporting center as well, um, can be really telling into what you're showing for and also give you ideas for new keywords. So of course, the search terms report, again, it breaks down searches, search queries that you've already shown for. So it's really interesting because you kind of get like an inside look at what the general public is looking up, which is great. Um, and that can be really telling into what you might need to be using as a keyword that you might not necessarily have thought of before. You also wanna maybe look at some keyword planning tools. So 
the Microsoft Advertising Intelligence is a great new tool that essentially acts as, it's similar to Google's Keyword Planner, where you're able to download tons of keyword data into an Excel sheet and you can filter it out from there. So it's really helpful to try and find tons of new keywords. Um, you can also, of course, use Google's Keyword Planner. So that'll help you brainstorm ideas, add them into your account and so on. So you would search a key or keyword term and then it'll spit out all these other keyword ideas. And then lastly, WordStream does have a free keyword tool. It's super helpful. I would recommend it to everyone here. Um, and the reason being is because it not only does it give you keyword ideas, but it also breaks down competition, costs, um, you know, things like that so that you can help get an idea of not only good keyword ideas, but also what to expect with those keywords. So I might find a really good keyword idea from the free keyword tool, but then I might see that it's, you know, really high in cost or, you know, potentially it's low competition. I definitely want to go for it. You know, so there's a ton of different scenarios there that you want to be thinking about when you're doing your keyword research. So definitely try and lean into a few different tools to just get a more robust feel and get different ideas from different types of um, online tools. And lastly, of course, local IQ is proprietary AI technology, um, automatically adds keywords for you. And so it makes data backed keyword recommendations uh, based on your historical performance. So definitely keep that in mind too. If you're hitting a wall with your keyword research over and over again, there's tools out there, machine learning that can help help you with the hard part and do the keyword brainstorming for you. And so you'll get recommendations and decide whether or not you want to try out those new keywords without having to do the heavy lifting of actually thinking of all the keywords, which can be the toughest part. So some thought starters for you all today. You can handle search marketing like a pro if you kind of stick to these four pillars here. So first and foremost, know that there is always, 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 always a solution. So if you feel like you're hitting a wall with your search marketing, don't give up. There's always a different way to approach it. There's no right or wrong answer when it comes to your search marketing. So be ready to get creative, think outside the box, leverage the tools that you have at hand to make your search marketing something great. Also, just know that you know some of the solutions that I talked about in here that we'll talk about in the Q&A and so on, you know, they might be different from what will work for you. And that's totally okay. Every business's strategy is going to look different on Google Ads, Microsoft Ads, and so on. Um, so just keep an open mind. If something doesn't quite work for you, totally okay. Think about your industry, your specific needs, and find what will work for you, right? Also, as you can probably tell from the themes throughout this webinar, technology is constantly evolving when it comes to Google Ads, Microsoft Ads, and marketing channels in general. So change is a constant. So be comfortable with change, be flexible, get ready to take on some artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions, not only you know, through local IQ proprietary technology, but we also know that Google Ads, Microsoft Ads, they're introducing new AI-based and machine learning-based solutions all the time, from smart, cam smart campaigns to recommendations to broad match, keyword matching, and so on. So it's really everywhere with search marketing. So be ready for it, get comfortable with it, and learn how to let the machine learning and the AI work for you, right? And it might take a little bit of trial and error, and that is okay, um, but just being embracing of that and, you know, as, as much as we don't want to give up manual control, which you absolutely don't have to, you need to be introducing some of those new solutions because that's really where this, the space is moving um, as these platforms are constantly introducing new changes, right? And then lastly, another theme that I definitely touched on, I think a lot throughout this webinar is a cross channel approach. So search marketing is great, but it can be even better when you're using it in combination with other channels to promote your business. So it's really like a win-win for you and your audience because you're using as all your different resources to show your business across all these different channels, all these different platforms. And then your audience is constantly getting something new, but also constantly getting exposed to your business to have the best customer experience possible, right? So using that cross-channel approach is really important as well. Great, so right now we're going to jump into a quick poll for you all. If you feel like you have specific challenges that you're still, you know, struggling with, or you know, you feel like you want a little bit more help, you want some expertise here, definitely hit yes on this poll question here to get individualized assessment um, from one of our experts that can really help you with your specific and unique needs. I understand everybody's is different, 
So definitely um, go ahead and hit yes on that poll if you feel like you also want to solve your own search marketing challenges. I know I talked about a lot of general ones here, uh, but definitely that can help you out. So we're going to keep the poll up here right now, um, and we're going to have that remain on the screen as we move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. So this will stay on, and this will be more of an audio portion here while we go ahead and jump into the Q&A. So this has been great so far. Definitely type in your questions. Um, you know, as we go through this, keep them coming in. And I'm looking now, and wow, holy smokes, we got a ton of questions coming in, a ton, a ton, a ton. This is great. So I'm going to start digging into some of these here. Um, so Karina asked from our last challenge topic here, what's some recommended time to optimize keywords? Great question, Karina. Um, so with the questions here, I'm going to go through them. So definitely type them in as we go. Um, but for this one, when should you optimize keywords? This is a question we get asked a lot. When's the best time to start tweaking things? It can feel really tricky when you're, you know, when you're watching your results and you're seeing them go down or you want to change your keywords and you're just not sure, like, I just made a change. Is it too soon? Or am I waiting too long and I'm losing money? Um, you know, a lot of folks get those types of que and questions coming up. I would say the hardest part of PPC search marketing and digital marketing in general is this joke I love to tell is the hardest part is patience, right? It's going to take time. So if a keyword doesn't give you results right away, totally normal and okay. I would say, and just a general rule of thumb for any change you want to make in PPC or in digital marketing, give it at minimum, minimum two weeks, because the machine learning and the algorithms on all of these different platforms take time to collect data and know what really works best for your account and your business. Um, so definitely, definitely just give it at least two weeks and let it ride out and try and collect some data. Not only that, but you also need data to know your next, next move. So if you have no data to back your change or your decision, that can be really tricky. Ideally, though, you want to give it at least 30 days to really, again, collect that data so you know what your next move should be, but also so the machine learning can prove itself as to whether that strategy is working or not. So I would say, you know, the best time to, you know, change your keywords there isn't really like a best time or day, you know, that's not going to really impact your campaign, but more of, all right, when was the last time I tweaked this keyword or I added new keywords? You know, it's been about two weeks a month. I should probably check in on those again. And I'd say that's that's reasonable. Erin asked a really cool question too for search campaigns. How many different ads should you have in any given search campaign? Great question, Erin, because this is actually relates back to a lot of the um, search marketing challenges that we've seen here. So as we know, there has been a ton of changes to the platforms um, throughout the last couple of years, including the sunset of expanded text ads, which are a certain type of ad within search campaigns. And now we're relying on these um, machine learning optimized responsive search ads that shuffle through multiple different headlines and descriptions to give the best possible ad in real time to different searchers. So because of that, you're constantly getting new ad combinations from the same ad. And with that, the best practice for the number of ads in your campaign has actually changed. Um, so, and this has again found in Google resources as well. Um, the, you know, the, the different, the amount of ads that you should be looking for is really gonna be one to three. And I would say that's max. And the reason why I say that is because you can get a lot more for a lot less in terms of the numbers of ads in your campaigns because of the machine learning and the optimizations that we have available today. So, you know, if you have a ton of ads in your account, I would cut the cord on that right away because you, first of all, it makes your management much more difficult because you have a ton of different ads that you're trying to figure out which one's the best one and you don't really know. But also too, you don't really need it. You need to really just focus on having high, high quality, a few ads in each ad group is really the best way to go. We have a ton of resources on account structure, so definitely check that out as well. Eddie asked a question here, and this is a common question I think comes up a lot. Do I suggest having single keyword ad groups or SCAGs as some of us know it as? Single keyword ad groups are such a hot topic in search marketing. And I would tell you that everybody has a different opinion on them. And there, it's a little bit of an older strategy. I will say that. And essentially what you do is you bid on one and just one keyword per, per ad group. And that's like your one core term. 
Eddie, I would say it's really, I'm not going to influence anyone and say one and lean one way or another, because it's really, it's all based on opinion for SCAGs. However, I will say you can get away with a lot less keywords than you used to, pretty much for the same reason that I was just explaining to Aaron for the responsive search ads. So you can get more out of less keywords because of the updated matching uh, capabilities. So would I suggest having single keyword ad groups? Not necessarily. It, it's really going to be dependent on your individual campaign and accounts needs. Um, but I will say this, that you know you don't want 100 or 200 or 300 <laughs> keywords in your ad group either, right? Because that's going to make management a nightmare. Right, because you again, you're digging through all those keywords, trying to figure out the best one, trying to figure out, you know, your bids, how to optimize them, and so on. Meanwhile, you might be limiting yourself with just one keyword, right? Because you're only saying you only want to match for that one keyword, and then oftentimes what we see with the SCAG strategy is then you have a million different ad groups, right, with one keyword, and where it's like you could combine those so that you don't have to manage a ton of different ad groups and then have a healthy amount of keywords within one ad group. So. I would definitely keep that in mind as well. All right, great, great, great. These are tons, tw tons of different questions coming in here. Keep these questions coming, this is great. Tons of questions here. Tracy asked if there would be a replay available. Again, reminder, this um, this webinar is recorded, so you will be able to easily access the recording on our YouTube and um, in your inbox later today. Anna asked a very timely question here. With the holidays coming up, how should advertisements and keywords reflect those prime selling blocks? Great question, Anna. I always suggest to folks to adjust their ad copy and their keyword strategy according to the holidays. So if you're doing a limited time promotion, mention that in your ads. If you're doing, you know, um, a certain, if you're doing promotions for Small Business Saturday, for example, you might want to add in a Small Business Saturday keyword just for that, you know, maybe a week before or after, um, just to catch that additional traffic that might be looking for it during that time. So I definitely say, yeah, flex your strategy to the holidays. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. And is there a prime selling block? Well, I think we know, you know, when there's definitely going to be more traffic, but that's also going to come with more costs, right? So it might get a little bit more competitive around, you know, the Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend. So just keep that in mind too. You can flex it, but also set your expectations realistic to what best fits for your business. Great questions here. Ed asks, how do we find out the keywords used in the market for our businesses, industry, and our competitors' websites are ranking on top of us? So there are a few ways that you can see who's ranking on top of you. There is a report in Google Ads called Auction Insights that can show you the different competitors um, that are also showing on the search engine results page at the same time as your ad. So I would definitely take a look at that. And then again, like I said, don't be afraid to hop on a Google search yourself and get that customer experience firsthand and see what other terms are on there, see what other keywords might be on there and so on. Um, great questions here. Laura asked something about Facebook ads. Great question, Laura, because I know Facebook ads definitely impact your PPC a lot. Like I mentioned, we have a ton of resources on that. Is there a rhyme or rhythm to writing Facebook ads? Is there a formula or a way to tackle that? Great question, Laura. Um, and I feel I feel for you all because I know a lot of these questions you're not necessarily going to get the answer that we all ideally would love. And that, of course, would be that there is one right or wrong answer. Of course, I'm going to tell you there is no set formula. There is no right or wrong way because, like I mentioned, every business strategy is different. So I know that's tough to hear, especially for questions like this. But there are some best practices and some recommendations you can keep in that mind. So, for example, when you're writing your Facebook ads, I would definitely keep in mind, you know, the character count there and how short or long your caption, your your content is going to be, because you don't want to lose your audience um, by having it super, super long. Well, you can get away with a lot more characters than you could on like a search engine um, campaign for Facebook ads, you don't want it to be so long that your audience gets lost in the point of your ad. So I would say that's like a general best practice to keep in mind when writing them. Um, I would also say, you know, I know Facebook ads aren't keyword optimized. They're not relying on keywords like a search engine um, campaign might, but 
you still want to include those buzzwords in there, right? So you really, I would say, kind of try and copy your Facebook ad copy, similar to what you might advertise on your search campaigns, because odds are the main messages there and the main terms that you want your audience to see are going to be the same. So that that's another kind of helpful best practice to hopefully help you out there. Um, Laura asked another good question about how many ads to be running, which we covered, of course, not as many as you think, right? Maybe one to three. And then how often would I recommend refreshing the ad content? Another great question, similar kind of to the keyword optimization question. I would say, you know, minimum two weeks to 30 days, you're good to start looking at um, the performance of your ad copy and when you should be refreshing it. Unless it's that case of like the holidays, like our other question asker here mentioned. Um, where you have maybe a limited time type of deal or something like that. Um, so you don't need to refresh ad copy as much as you might think on search anyway. However, for high frequency platforms like Facebook, you might find that you need to um, refresh them a little bit more. So I would really let the data tell the story there to understand when you should best uh, change it up. Great questions here. Some folks asked where the data I source for our statistics in this webinar came from. That was a question from Martha. Again, um, the data was sourced in the bottom left of the slides, which you'll be able to see in the recording and the playback materials that you'll get in your inbox. It came from WordStream's digital marketing statistics blog. So definitely check that out. Great questions here. All right, last question here. I know we're getting close to time. So I just want to um, touch on these last couple of questions here. And this was great. I wish I could answer all of your questions. As you can probably tell, I could talk about this all day. So Ed asked, um, why isn't his search ads ranking higher? He's not coming up on the first page. I love digging into this. There's a lot that can be unpacked here. But basically, your ad rank is going to come down to a few things. It's gonna come down to your bidding strategy. So if you're not bidding high enough, you're not gonna show up at the top of the page. But you know, I understand it's not always feasible to just dump budget into something. So some of the other things that you could be thinking about is the quality of your ad. So is it relevant? Is it including your keywords to show to Google that you're serving a really high quality ad? Because in Google's mind, it has this job to do. It needs to serve good quality results to its searcher. So it's going to favor your ad if it's of a higher quality. So definitely try that as well. And then also to um, your, in addition to your bids and your ad, I would also take a look at your landing page and the relevancy there. So um, again, just keeping in mind, you know, is your landing page what you're leading folks to also relevant, including your keywords and relating back to the ad that you're serving. All of those are factors that Google looks at when it comes to ranking your ad. So I think that could help you rank. I would also be open to reworking your keyword strategy. You know, I think a lot of folks get stuck on, you know, this one keyword, they really want it, they want to bid for it, they want to show as the first ad on the page, and it just might not be realistic. So trying to think of other keywords that could be just as effective can be just as helpful as well when it comes to ranking. Um, great questions here. I know we're right at time. There's a ton more that I could dig into. Um, but it, again, if you didn't get your question answered, make sure you hit yes on that poll to get your questions answered individually. Um, and be sure to keep your eyes out for other webinars coming up. Like I said, we do them at least monthly. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. This was great. And with that, we'll, I'll wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. This was great. Great questions, everyone.